I, I want to bring in uh, uh, Charles Lee, the CEO of Hong Kong Exchange. Uh, just want to read a brief intro of Charles. He served as chief executive of Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing Limited since 2010. In this role, he's been pivotal in making some very strategic initiatives for the ex Hong Kong Exchange and its history, including the acquisition of the London Metal Exchange in 2012, OTC Clear in 2013, you have Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, you have Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, you have the Bond Connect that happened about two or three years ago. He's also sought to strengthen Hong Kong's role as an offshore renminbi hub. He's also led Hong Kong Exchange's efforts to reform its listing regime to maintain Hong Kong's competitiveness and secure its position as the leading IPO center. They're hoping to be number one again this year. Charles? Welcome to, to Invest Global. It's great to be here, Ivana. Wonderful time to join you, having all this great discussion. Yes, and let's kick it off. I mean, Hong Kong Exchange just coming off of what's been a couple weeks of, of very strong debuts on these secondary listings, these Chinese tech companies coming back home, starting with Alibaba, we had NetEase, and then JD.com last week. Your chairman, Laura Cha, told us just last week, she hopes 2020 is going to be a better year than last year. What's your take? Well, this is going to be a big year, no matter what. Uh, I think because not only about all the companies coming uh, from uh, U.S. and other market back to Hong Kong, we're also going to have a lot of big homegrown IPOs coming up this year. So I'm not sure whether this year we're going to be number one again, but it's looking um, that we will definitely be um, very strong and it's going to be uh, uh, very uh, competitive. Uh, it's, a, it's a great market. Um, the underlying market is very strong, very resilient, despite all the challenges we're facing today. But right now, you take a look at these Chinese tech giants and mainland investors, they still can't get their hands on these shares in Hong Kong. What's the chance that that scope of expanding the southbound stock connect and, and expanding that to include some of these companies? Well, it's not a matter of uh, whether they will be included. It's really gonna be a matter as to uh, when they will be included. At this point, all the, uh, you know, the Hong Kong side of the uh, issues are very much resolved. And I think we're working with our partners in the North to ensure that their issues being addressed largely that uh, they want to see some hope that uh, some of those great companies when they will consider a domestic listing. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the issues that we, uh, you know, working with them, but ultimately even everybody agreed that uh, having a lot of the customers of, of, of many of these great companies to become their shareholder is the common interest of all parties involved. What, what sort of t timing can you tell us on that? Is this a priority to you to get some of these stocks included? on the Stock Connect, especially that some of these companies might be included in the Hang Seng pretty soon too? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that they are things that we can do here in Hong Kong, including, uh, you know, uh, some of the changes in the, uh, uh, the system and the, the rules that will allow them to be potentially designated uh, slightly different from its current form. But that may or may not necessarily uh, uh, be sufficient uh, for us to reach agreement to, with our friends uh, uh, in Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen. But I'm sure um, this is something that uh, uh, is in the horizon. And I don't want to give you a specific time, but uh, it's coming. It's coming. OK. D did you think it runs against Beijing's own ambitions then? Of, of reforming its own stock boards. We just learned last week that the CSRC is gonna speed up the process to include the Shanghai Starboard stocks onto the Stock Connect. How does that change the attraction, I guess, of, of Hong Kong and the Peel versus Shanghai when some of these high growth companies choose where to list? It's highly consistent with the broader policy goals of China and policy goals of the regulator. Uh, and also you know, consistent with even the commercial uh, interests or competitive interests of the exchanges. It just sometimes, you know, uh, you know, with the COVID, with everything, uh, we just need a bit more patience. We got everything done, everything we ever wanted to get done. Ultimately, you know, most of them got done, and I'm very confident that this will get done. Do, do you see China's reforms in affecting Hong Kong's IPO outlook in a longer term perspective if 
especially we, we continue to see political unrest here in the city? No, I think uh, uh, one thing people uh, sometimes do not fully appreciate that uh, um, the market uh, are really mutually reinforcing and mutually helping each other. So the more open China is, the more opportunities we actually have. Obviously, you know, when they are more open, you have slightly different opportunities when they are more closed. So it's not about a, a binary thing that if they're more open, then people are not coming here. And, uh, you know, we are very differentiated in our roles, in our functions, and in our, you know, mutual, uh, you know, complementary strength. So I'm, you know, as long as we remain agile, we remain resilient, and we remain relevant, we will always be able to solve the problems that they couldn't solve at a particular time. And when they're able to solve those problems, we're going to move on to solve other problems that they are. As long as China continue to open, and as long as that we are able to remain on a competitive distance and a differentiation, we will always be succeed together. But investor confidence, uh, no doubt, it has been eroded in some ways with this national security legislation. I bring it back to the poll survey that we just conducted with people that are viewing this conversation right now, Charles. And most are, are it's pretty split right now. 38% say that Hong Kong will not remain a global financial hub. 37% say yes, Hong Kong will survive the stress test. Uh, we just got this draft bill of this national security legislation, and, and the central government has confirmed that they can actually trump the Hong Kong legal system when it comes to national security issues. How are you maintaining or reassuring investors right now that this is not going to be the, as big of a deal or at least address the concerns that they have right now? Well, there is going to be absolutely short-term anxieties and short-term um, uh, you know, uh, discomfort because this is not something that people are used to before. And also, in light of all the massively geopolitically sensitive time that we live in, this will be, you know, so, you know, it's fully understandable. But I think if anybody who really understands Hong Kong, understand China's, um, you know, overall traditional, um, you know, philosophical approach, you know, in Hong Kong, they should really, uh, you know, uh, pretty easy conclude that ultimately the long-term impact is limited because, you know, two systems, one country, two systems, absolutely works for the best interests of China. And I think uh, no matter what happens, no matter what uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, government will do, you know, in terms of its conflict with China, and um, I think ultimately, and even with the national security law introduction, Hong Kong will remain to be the most international, the most open, the most free, the most, uh, um, you know, Western uh, market of China. So maybe slightly today, you know, we used to be people think, used to know us as the most uh, Chinese, inter, you know, kind of an international market. Maybe tomorrow we will still be the most international and most Chinese market. But I think in order for people to have um, a better comfort on this very emotional issue, I think it's important to quickly have a few words about, you know, how do we, why we are here and, uh, and also how this is gonna be implemented and how people are thinking about it. I think we are here on a very, very simple issue. I mean, it's, one country, two systems sounds like a, a, a very complex issue, but in fact, if you look at China, is very emotionally about one country, but it's very rationally, you know, accepting that two systems in Hong Kong is the best for China. And on the converse side, we people in Hong Kong are very emotionally invested in two systems because we want our freedom to be preserved, our market structure to be preserved, our common law, rule of law to be preserved. So we're very emotionally right. invested in two systems. All we need is that we rationally also embracing or accepting or at least not oppose one country. So our interests are very much matched. China emotionally about one country, but rationally wants this to be two systems. And we want it to be emotionally and be two system. All we need is to really make sure we don't challenge two system and not challenge one country. Back on this sure. uh, national security law, 
And I think, um, you know, we are all been debating over the last uh, couple of weeks about whether or not this is going to be done through a Hong Kong system and, you know, in its original common law framework or it's going to be imposed from China. I think, um, you know, it's becoming quite clear today. I mean, basically what we really wanted, and the, since we have to introduce a tiger, the, one, the China want to make sure this is not a toothless tiger that is not going to be able to bite when it's need to bite. But obviously yeah. people in Hong Kong want to make sure that this tiger and you know only bites when it should and doesn't really bite all the time. So how to remain the most delicate balance is the key. And I think um, it, I, I was looking at the rules and that just came out. It looks like uh, it's going to be local tiger, but maybe with some supervision. Okay, we have a viewer question. Uh, could be a good follow up to to what you just said here. William Barr, the U.S. Attorney General, did speak about intervention today. He wants U.S. companies to stand up for, for the U.S. and reduce business with China. Do you see this having a potential damage to, to China and Hong Kong? Well, anytime a U.S. president or attorney general says something like that, it's not helpful. Um, in fact, if they ever wanted Hong Kong to succeed in its original uh, uh, and terms, this is not something um, terribly helpful. I know maybe they have a particular, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical and ideological angle to it. But in the end, you know, Hong Kong, as I said, is just going to continue to thrive simply because China wanted it to be two system. As long as that one country sensitivity and emotional needs is being addressed. But, and with this but, security you know, law, hopefully. I was, I was going to yes. say, U.S. Government, U.S. government, though, has been scrutinizing uh, these Chinese companies that are listed in the U.S. They're threatening to delist them. Uh, Hong Kong's special trading status could be a threat under a lot of uncertainty right now. How does Hong Kong Exchange view this right now? Net-net, is this actually a win-or-lose uh, situation for Hong Kong Exchange? What can be done? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the U.S. Uh, and, you know, regulations or proposed legislations on the Chinese listing companies are all about their being Chinese. At least that's not what they said. I hope they don't do that because that's not what I read in those legislations. It's all about accounting standards, about uh, regulatory compliances. So in that regard, we're all having exactly the same common interest. We don't want substandard companies to be listed in any market. We don't want them to be here if they are not able to qualify in the United States or if they are delisted because of those reasons. I don't think the American yeah. government will actually delist all this just simply because they're Chinese. So from that perspective, all good companies, they will come back, not because they are going to be deterred by the American legislation, but obviously the less friendly environment and sentiment in the US is now helping them having a lot of confidence. But we're here, you know, good companies can come back, bad companies don't qualify anyway. And when they do come back, if they feel that this is a better place for them, you know, more trading will happen here. So at this point, we are uh, seeing tremendous interest, both in terms of issuers wanting to have another secondary listing. You know, some may eventually yeah. want to move to primary listing. We all welcome, but at the same time, if people want to go to America, we still think they should because there are things in America that is unique, and some of those companies find their unique uh, match with the investors there. Charles, uh, we, we have to go in a couple minutes, but we have one more viewer question. Are there more luck and coffees out there waiting to be discovered? And, and if we do see the, these companies and these audit questions remain, is that going to temper the IPO exuberance we've seen here? Yeah, um, we're going to see bad apples all the time, and they are existing here, China, US, Europe, and everywhere. And all the, and, you know, the key is to make sure the bad apple don't succeed, the bad apple don't really fool the regulator. In fact, in many ways, the bad apples are much finding it's much harder to fool raw regulator here than in the U.S. simply because the distance, because of the lack of familiarity, with, uh, it's much easier to handle a bad story in a Florida retirement community than they can do in Hong Kong. We see through them right away. So they're not coming here because they know they're going to be seen through very quickly here. Charles, we know that your, your time at Hong Kong Exchange uh, ends 
next year in October. What, what, tell us a little bit more about the legacy that, that you want to leave behind. What was your proudest moment at Hong Kong Exchange and what are some things that you still want to accomplish before you leave? Well, this is really uh, the most interesting and most dynamically exciting 10 years uh, of my career. And uh, we just happened to be at a time when China is becoming so important to the world and the world is becoming so important to China. So the last three years, uh, last 10 years, we really just trying to break barriers. So there are really three major breakthroughs that I'm the most proud of. Essentially breaking uh, Hong Kong exchange into commodities into international. We used to be just equity, just Hong Kong, and now we're international. We are, uh, you know, FICC, number one. Number two, breakthrough into uh, China's capital control barrier. We know China will maintain capital control for a long time in the future, but how to find a way to allow that capital control to exist, to give China the confidence, but meanwhile, allow the market to have a truly free back and forth. We achieved that. Uh, uh, Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai Connect, Shenzhen Connect, and Bank Connect. So connectivity is the second big thing. The last thing is we used to be uh, largely an old economy, banks and property company listing, you know, venue with very little diversification, particularly very little DNA for new economy and new technology. The reform, the listing reform is a massive breakthrough. Today, we are able to compete on new economy, new technology, biotech, with anybody, anybody on the world. And I think we will become, you know, we will, you know, I'm a big soccer, uh, uh, you know, a crazy soccer guy. We will go into the World Cup finals. I'm confident of that. Okay, real quick though, anything else that you still wanna do before you leave? Uh, well, I just, uh, I, I just think, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what we wanted to, to people to truly understand that a lot of those challenges, particularly in Hong Kong with the emotional charge, the debate uh, about one country, two systems, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the system as it is today absolutely works for everybody. There's no reason for China to change fundamentally. And there's no reason that people in Hong Kong wanted to change uh, you know, radically. But sometimes you know, we just need to be thinking emotionally what's the other side care and what rationally they need and we match that and we don't have to again get ourselves caught up in a moment where we could have easily rationally accepted something so that we can preserve what is important for us emotionally and we some when you miss that then you get yourself into a real hard place between uh, a rock and a hard place. And uh, I think we're gonna get out of this because again, I'm still tremendously confident that China want one country, two system. They do not want to make Hong Kong into another Shenzhen or Shanghai. It's not in their fundamental interest. So I think, you know, the survey, if we do this survey in six months, I'm sure the survey will be very different from what you're seeing on your screen right now. Charles, we got to leave it there, but thank you so much for kicking off Invest Global with us. It was a great conversation. I'm glad we got some of the viewer questions in as well. Everyone, thank you so much. Charles Lee, Hong Kong Exchange.